Afternoon, everyone. So a uh, quick overview of uh, what today's agenda is going to be covering. We're going to do an overview of backup and recovery on AWS and the features and capabilities there. We're going to talk a little bit about using Cloud Protection Manager uh, from N2WS, a uh, partner here to help us to do uh, um, re uh, detection, recovery, and um, how they were able to integrate this workflow uh, with uh, our customer. And then we're going to dive into specifically how uh, Notre Dame was able to use N2WS for data protection and business continuity for their workload and how they were able to integrate both the AWS platform as well as the partner solution. And then we'll open it up for Q&A so that you guys have an opportunity to ask questions about how this worked out and how uh, the customer was able to achieve this. So quick overview, uh, just going to talk a little bit about backup and recovery on the AWS platform. Um, there are common backup and recovery challenges that we see for all customers in all spaces. And these deal with things around the old world of manual backup, which was difficult to uh, deal with at scale. You had storage needs that scaled uh, based on different types of workloads and different types of environments. It's difficult to scale those up on demand. Uh, high cost, you had to deal with getting infrastructure that uh, oftentimes had to deal with that peak capacity when it wasn't necessarily always needed. And then from a compliance perspective, you had to make sure that that solution would allow you to attain the compliance that you were uh, going for. So for a regulated environment or trying to comply with uh, a workload uh, framework like NIST 853, I have to make sure that it's properly secured, audited, and attestable for those control frameworks. So uh, the benefits for AWS backup and recovery are that uh, first it's integrated natively into the platform. So it's very easy to make sure that we're um, using these solutions to uh, use by multiple AWS services. So if I wanna go from EC2 to RDS to S3 to file gateway to storage gateway, all of them have a strong story in this space. Uh, also, the ability to make sure that those mission-critical workload backups are secure uh, using either solutions directly from AWS like KMS, HSM, or to use your own cryptographic solution on top of AWS. Uh, for uh, uh, ease to maintain, we want to make sure that there is no need to uh, buy or maintain infrastructure where you don't need it. So uh, get rid of that on-prem legacy infrastructure and go directly with AWS so you can copy directly to AWS via services like the S3 API, file gateway, storage gateway, which will emulate virtual tape libraries. Uh, the ability, again, to automatically scale up and scale down based on the workload. So if you have a, a situation where you need to quickly do uh, recovery, AWS and partners like N2, uh, N2WS can help you accelerate that process and give you a more streamlined disaster recovery workflow. And then of course, importantly, the pay-as-you-go model that's inherent with AWS, the ability to only pay for resources when you're actually using them and then uh, throw those resources away and not pay for them when you're not actually using them. Quick overview on some of the storage capabilities as it pertains to backup on the AWS platform. Uh, the Simple Storage, Simple storage Service, S3, uh, is an object store that allows you to store uh, to you know, an infinite amount of storage. Uh, we see customers use this in a multitude of different ways from direct S3 access to things like S3 and frequent access. Uh, Lifecycle policies going to services like Amazon Glacier, which are meant for long-term deep storage archives. Uh, but the ability to seamlessly go from one storage class to another based on a condition like time. And then services like Elastic Block Store, so that you have that direct attached block storage on these volumes that you can use to uh, write or integrate with existing software solutions that maybe you're running today, uh, now running them fully on AWS and EC2. AWS operates a global infrastructure, so from, again, a backup and disaster recovery perspective, this is a strong enabler in that it allows you to uh, choose to keep your operation where you are right now and use AWS as your DR site. So if you're, for instance, a customer on the West Coast and you're concerned about environmental issues or earthquake flood, you can use AWS as your DR site on the East Coast. Or if you're a customer that has data that's not subject to data sovereignty issues, you can use a completely different region in the world. Uh, AWS opens all the regions to you directly in the console uh, and allows you to have that choice of where to place that data. The benefits of APN partners uh, to help you in this journey is that they'll give you a situation and a solution that is easy to configure, 
allows you to do uh, incremental backups and block level backups, which is especially important for integration with existing on-prem solutions. Uh, asynchronous replication, and most importantly, when you're doing disaster recovery, you want a solution that will give you rapid recovery capabilities. Uh, the ability to you know, bring that data back to your chosen disaster recovery region or back on-prem in the most expeditious way possible. Um, using that same Amazon scale pay-as-you-go model, we want to make sure that that is a cost-effective solution. So they're riding on top of the same AWS services that you would leverage natively. So again, pay-as-you-go, only consume what you need to. And then uh, policy-based uh, controls. So again, making sure that only authorized individuals have the capability of performing data recovery where it's actually part of their job duty or part of their uh, job role. So making sure that folks that have access to this data are the ones that should have access to this data. So AWS offers customers a number of uh, compliance frameworks that we offer to our customers. Uh, some of the services uh, that you can access through a tool like Artifact are SOC 1, SOC 2 reports. But the key takeaway here is that whether or not you're going for a FedRAMP ATO, a CGIS based work, uh, workload, or you're a healthcare customer looking for a HIPAA based compliant environment, AWS gives you the tools and technologies that allows you to securely store and use AWS as your primary data store or as an alternate data store for that backup and recovery workload. So now I wanna hand things over to our partner at N2WS to talk a little bit about how their solution works and integrates and how it ultimately helped our uh, mutual customer at Notre Dame. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks so much. So uh, the session title was originally called, uh, had to do with Harvard and Ron Hawkins from Harvard, but uh, you know, we're, we're in the business of selling resilience and the word resilience is like understanding that you know, we live in this world where we can't control everything and things go wrong. I don't know if Ron had the lo mein or quinoa salad for lunch, but he wasn't able to join us. And, uh, you know, being in the business of resilience, I really appreciated that uh, Aaron, who's another happy customer of ours, happened to be on the show floor at the right time. I walked up to him, I said, one o'clock, we have this session, it's all planned, we got you guys. So uh, I really had a sense of appreciation for what we're offering customers, which is this same sense of resilience. It's like things are gonna go wrong in our lives and, and with, the, with the tools we're made and with the systems we're uh, charged with keeping up and running, and uh, N2WS sells giant recovery buttons. We sell that resilience. We sell that ability to stand back up when and if things go wrong. And um, just a bit about us, I think our slides are a little bit off, but we were founded in 2012. Our product was released uh, in 2013. We're one of the top solutions in the AWS marketplace. Uh, headquartered in West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, we have a dev center in Haifa, Israel, and some uh, satellite sales and marketing offices around the world. So this cloud thing is happening. It's, uh, I don't know if anybody's questioning that, it's here. But uh, AWS provides this awesome infrastructure, but it's up to you as an AWS customer to ensure that your data is always protected and easily recoverable. It's up to you to ensure that resilience, um, according to kind of whatever your standard is. And this is the AWS shared responsibility model. This is that line in the sand that defines what AWS is assuming responsibility for and providing as a service and what's up to you as a customer of AWS. And you can see that data protection, protection of your customer data is firmly in your part in that blue section of the shared responsibility model. But uh, AWS is providing some awesome infrastructure and awesome regions and, and services that we can leverage but uh, you know, the, you know, we all have our own determination for what we need uh, to ensure resilience for how we wanna make sure our workloads are protected. And I guess it comes up with uh, why you need to protect data on AWS. What are the things you're at risk for? And like contingency planning, it really could be anything, but human error is a huge thing. If somebody accidentally terminates an RDS instance and deletes all your snapshots, I, you know, you know, that's something that can happen. Humans make mistakes, things go wrong. Um, availability zone failures, these are not often occurrences, but they do happen. It's, it's something that you need to be aware of. Ransomware, there's documented cases of people getting hit with ransomware on AWS. It's, it's destroyed a company or two, and uh, this is something that you can protect yourself from uh, according to your own needs. 
backups are also important because of compliance and data security concerns. If you're launching applications into production, uh, you're part of that DevOps process, ensuring regular backups are happening and that are auditable and you can prove that they're happening is often an important piece to this. And EBS volumes are physical drives sitting in a data center somewhere. And you know, while they're very durable, they are physical drives and they can fail. And when they fail, you want to be able to stand them back up. You want to be able to have that control. So just a, a quick poll. AWS provides snapshots. Um, just by a show of hands, is any of you taking regular snapshots of your environment, some kind of automated way? Or, uh, a couple of hands showed up. But uh, snapshots, if you're not aware of them, are an unbelievable uh, backup solution. They're block level incremental backups, meaning uh, they're only capturing the delta since the previous successful backup, giving you a very small footprint uh, that's you know, recoverable, recoverable to any of the points. What our product does is manages and orchestrates snapshots, kind of took this uh, snapshot backup and turned it into enterprise level backup and recovery. We focus on flexible and automated backup policies, the ability to recover literally in seconds, and Aaron from Notre Dame is going to talk about this a bit. Um, no data ever leaves your cloud. So uh, you saw, saw Brad's little uh, table of different certifications that AWS has. We're an appliance, a, a virtual appliance, a Linux instance that sits inside your AWS environment and manages and orchestrates everything from within. So there's no egress of data, nothing flowing back to us. This is, you know, if you're operating workloads in GovCloud, we have a solution for GovCloud you can easily leverage. Everything is easy, efficient, and effective. So by leveraging this native infrastructure underneath, we're able to provide uh, much higher levels of service than you may have seen with traditional on-prem backup solutions. So uh, I like to call our product the promise of the cloud delivered because that's really what it is. It's like you, you got to AWS and you had this vision of automatic failover between 18 data centers and having it all easy and done, but you saw that it was quite a bit of work to kind of orchestrate all that. You had to be aware of some lambda scripting and the APIs and CLIs and work with snapshots and leverage the regions. What we did is we kind of filled in the rest of the picture. We kind of we put together a very simple UI, couple of mouse clicks, you can copy data all over the place, you can recover with your giant recovery buttons, we have auditing, reporting, alerting, different uh, very cool DR scenarios, file level recovery because disasters come in all shapes and sizes, and then uh, also application uh, aware and consistent backup. Application consistent backup is incredibly important if you're running production workloads on AWS, anything like MongoDB, Cassandra, MySQL. Um, so we have uh, some interesting cross-region disaster recovery scenarios that you can leverage. You can securely copy snapshots using our product to the 18 data centers around the world. The cool thing about this is, is if you're running, running workloads in, let's say, North Virginia, for example, and something goes wrong in North Virginia, you, you have copies of data three time zones away in Oregon. Uh, they're, st they're sitting there in cold storage as snapshots, giving you something that's very cost effective and very efficient. When something goes wrong in North Virginia, if it goes wrong, you click your giant recovery button and 30 seconds later you're stood up in Oregon. If you think about like just a couple of years ago what it took to kind of orchestrate a scenario like that, you're talking about a ton of investment, building out data centers on opposite ends of the country with some kind of replication between them. So leveraging AWS, you can actually uh, come up with really creative, cost-effective ways of ensuring resilience. Another thing we talk about with our product is cross-account disaster recovery. So the ransomware malware examples, you know, your account can get compromised. Some of, some of our accounts, there's many, many people that have access to a single AWS account. And some of those people, you know, we kind of look at a little weird sometimes. So um, you can set up a separate, highly secure AWS account that you copy critical snapshots to. So maybe one person has access to this, just the CTO. If your core account gets compromised, you have a recovery account available. You can also combine these two scenarios to almost set up like what's uh, an Iron Mountain repository that you've built yourself. If you think about what Iron Mountain provided, they pulled up to your business and grabbed backup tapes and went for long drives across the country, buried those tapes inside some kind of mountain. But uh, you're doing the, the, the same type of thing. You're, you're thinking about like, okay, I'm worried that my workload in North Virginia in this account can go down, so maybe I want to copy snapshots to a separate account on another continent and use that as a failover site. And you end up with, a, with this. This is, what you're, this is what you've planned up until. 
So short of the giant asteroid that takes us all out, you are recoverable and your data is available. So uh, we have a bunch of customers out there, including Harvard, Notre Dame, Goodwill, some other folks out there that uh, can talk to you about how they're leveraging our solution. Uh, our product supports multi-tenancy, so th this is incredibly important if you're in the service provider space or if you're in, in kind of corporate IT servicing many different departments, something like that, you can use one cloud protection manager instance to support many different AWS environments, self-service options, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, offer this as a managed service or, or offer it as a backup as a service, so it's a very flexible solution. And uh, this is our NASCAR slide here. You can see Notre Dame and Harvard on there and Cardinal Health and a whole bunch of other folks. The thing these folks have in common is they've all made heavy investments in AWS and are thinking about resilience. They're thinking about how they make sure their environments are always up and available. Just a couple of cu customer quotes before I turn it over to Aaron. It is a very simple product. Anybody can learn how to build out a resilient AWS environment. There's no scripting required, no, you know, just a couple of mouse clicks, you can get it done. Uh, we ensure application consistency for both Windows and Linux workloads. Uh, we have uh, VSS support on Windows and a very creative way of quiescing production uh, databases to get consistent snapshots. And uh, where we shine is in that recovery. What you want is a giant recovery button. When things go wrong, you don't want to be scrambling with snapshots, turning them into volumes and trying to mount them. You want something that you can depend on, that you can test, that you can drill, and that when you click on it, you know exactly what's going to happen. And uh, that's where we shine. It's an instant recovery, automated and straightforward. And so. Uh, what uh, Aaron's going to talk about now is how you can protect your AWS workloads with snapshots, how you can recover a single file or an environment. Uh, we also offer support for literally anything running on, on uh, Amazon EC2. Uh, Aaron can talk a little bit about the SAP implementation he has on EC2. Uh, many customers doing many creative things with this product. Uh, you can save quite a bit of time by investing in a solution like this, and you can protect yourself from any type of malicious attack. And with that, I want to introduce Aaron, who's going to go through some of the University of Notre Dame's use cases. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ezra, for the uh, introduction there. I'm going to reintroduce myself again. My name is Aaron Wright. I work for the University of Notre Dame. I've been in IT over 20 years. I've been with the university approximately about 15 years now, and I over have 24 years of military experience. So I love, enjoy coming to Washington, D.C. because I love the history of the city and I get to see the U.S. Uh, Navy Memorial as well. So what, before we go ahead, we're going to kind of give you a brief, uh, syn uh, brief synapse of what's going on with the University of Notre Dame, who we are, uh, what's our role as a department at the university, how we implemented uh, data protection within the cloud and how we got to the cloud, and how we're uh, saving money as well. We've been around for over 106 years. It started back on a snow cold bitter day in uh, November of 26, 1842. A man named Reverend Edward Soren came up from Vincent's, Indiana with seven companions. He uh, was uh, gifted from the Vincent's of uh, the Bishops of Vincent's 524 acres of land. When he got up there, uh, he found the two lakes and he named it La Université de Lake, de Lac, excuse me, pardon my French, no pun intended. Um, that, was, uh, that was one of the reasons of the university and said named after our, our mother, Mary. Also, we are one of the top affiliated uh, education religious uh, un universities in the United States. As of right now, we just recently ranked one of the top 15 uh, jobs in IT to work for as far as largest company out of 100 from uh, Computer World. Office Information Technology. Who are we? We're an enterprise-wide uh, computing campus. We support large, wide enterprise scale applications all the way down to the simple things as you know, printing and computing. So one of the things that we were looking to do to get in the, the cloud is trying to reduce our environment, our, our hardware cost. And uh, we taken an analysis and we looked at how can we do that. Um, we were primarily closing our data center because of, of uh, things that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, and we were very coherent to, as far as presentations and delivering IT service by reducing the hardware 
with in our university, we can actually focus a little bit more on delivering other services to the university besides focusing on you know maintaining uh, patches on hardware for our virtualization or our storage, et cetera. Some of the things that we are, right, as of right now, we're 80% in the cloud, and uh, we plan on going to 90% at the end of the calendar year. Some of the biggest things, as you can see, as we've migrated is our ERP system. It's called Banner. That right there is about 16 terabytes of data with four different uh, major databases, and we had to basically uh, shift and lift and shift that data out to the cloud. So one of the other things that um, we did is, just, okay, when we started getting our, to their journey, we've, we've uh, decided, okay, how are we gonna do this? So the, the, lift and shift mo the lift and shift idea was to go ahead and take our data and take it out to the cloud. Um, the other thing is, is right now, we are running at about 530 instances, and we're projected to go to about 700 instances into the, um, into the, into the cloud. We have over 50 AWS accounts, and most of them are not ours. Those are going to our individual colleges that have IT departments, and they are using the cloud to develop their own software and uh, services as they can provide to re do research. University is really big on doing research as becoming a premier uh, institute, so we can now actually develop, uh, excuse me, develop new ideas, and not only to help the university, but help the world. We primarily back up EC2 instances as of right now, but we're also doing RDS. We also do uh, SQL and um, Oracle, and those are the two of the biggest uh, applications is that we back up. We primarily back up with the instances using the N2WS, and our guys that are in, uh, doing the database administrators, they prefer to do their own backups within our organization. They are using RMAN and SQL's custom scripting, and those uh, basically go through to, those are going to S3 as we speak. One of the things about our journey, I'm gonna go back one, sorry. One of the things about our journey, how did we get there? So the journey was basically when we had a, there was a tragedy a few years ago with uh, uh, Virginia Tech. And um, we were doing an analysis and how can we, how can we notify our students and faculty and staff when there's such an event? When we were doing an, um, what we called a, a public announcement service, we were providing that, but we went to our public announcement, public affairs office and said, what is, the, what is the least amount of downtime that you guys can have? And they said 15 minutes. And we had that shock of you know, 15 minutes, there's no way we can get them up in 15 minutes. Normally our SLA is 24 hours. So we took a step back and we said, okay, maybe the, you know, the on-premise is not the best idea. What we decided to do is start looking out the cloud. How can the cloud provide us the ability to go and uh, give us that re resiliency and that flexibility and that scalability and that cost savings and agility to provide that information or to s that provide the information gives us support to our customers. And when we started doing that journey, the journey was started out with really small. We started with our WWS services and we started doing this lift and shift and then we started getting to from our small services to our intermediate services then to our enterprise services. When we got there, we were starting to, okay, what do we need to do? We can't manually or uh, script these backups for our EC2 instances and other services that are provided by AWS. So we sent, then we started looking for a centralized backup services. And to AWS, it was the best thing at the time. We, we still use it at the time. I, I absolutely love it. Excuse me, I absolutely love it because it's easy to recover. I can get an instance back up within 30, 30 seconds to five minutes. It's remarkable. When I'm thinking 30 seconds to five minutes, that's absolutely outstanding. When I'm doing it on premise, and I'm going from storage and I'm copying uh, VMware files, et cetera, it sometimes, depending on the size of your VM, it take, could take up to 30 to 45 minutes. And that's where that resiliency comes in because it's, it gives you the uh, capability of with the AWS environment, you have uh, redundancy within your storage because you go from, go, go from 
different availability zones. You know, if you have an outage or you have a cyber warfare attack, you have the capability of re, re, restoring your services. And within 2WS, you can restore that. The compliancy is uh, we use GloveCloud too because we do uh, research with um, government institutes and other university institutes that require sensitive data. And right now we're running um, a separate instance out there that's for a CPM to do all of our backups in that environment as well. Cost effective, you have your snapshots that reduces the, the cost in there. It's all incremental like they were saying earlier. Uh, your full, and you have your standardization, you have that one backup solution that is centralized. You don't have to worry about um, doing your own manual backups. So continuing on uh, centralizing, we talk about enabling Notre Dame to fulfill this object of providing a true cloud uh, service. Like I said, we have that centralized backup and recovery process. Um, we also have security layers and recovery into different regional accounts. One of the things that we do is uh, when we set up policies in the AWS, like our production services, I not only have it going from one region to another, from the East Coast to West Coast, but also have it going to another account, a disaster recovery account, in case we do have a cyber attack and we do have our account compromised. Uh, we do granularity of single file restore, and I'll explain that to you in a scenario here in a minute. It's also reliable with the continuous of business, and it's really easy to click and deploy from the AWS marketplace. There are some things that you may want to do when you do that. Um, from my personal experience, read the documentation uh, using like uh, assume roles. That's an easier way to control uh, your access through your accounts. And not only that, uh, does it prevent you from using access keys. One of the scenarios that we have uh, done is we ran into back in March of 2018, we were doing a patch cycle and the Linux team ran into some issues. They had a, when they were patching the OS, they had some bad, uh, bad patches. So uh, with the way that we did our naming conventions with the policies, our engineers were able to go into the snapshots and recovery and find that snapshot and recover the OS within five minutes. And normally, like I said in the previously, when we do it on premise, it takes a little bit longer depending on the size. It could take 30 minutes to 45 minutes. I've seen if we had 300 gigabytes of storage, it takes up to about three hours to restore, and that's at 10 gigabytes of back-end network as well. The other thing that we ran into is we're using a SIF share out in AWS, and we have people that put out files out there for their own personal WW space, and when he, we had one professor that just lost an entire folder. So we got an incident coming in and uh, was like, all right, this is a perfect opportunity to use a single granularity uh, file restore within, uh, within Cloud Protection Manager. So I got in there and I was able to find his files within five to 10 minutes. Next thing you know, I downloaded it back onto the server and he was back up, the customer was satisfied. Some of the things that we uh, looked at is uh, reducing the cost. And that cost is um, basically what we're doing within our AWS and, or within on-premise and how we can, like I said, restore that, that capabilities of having engineers coming on, uh, focusing on other projects within AWS. We are really expanding on other services with you know, DynamoDB, um, uh, what, well, WAF, the, the security, AWS security module. Um, we're doing other things as far as storage and other services that we want to provide. As of right now, like I said, 80% we're in the cloud of right now, but at the end of this year, we'll have 90% in. Uh, we would like to be 100%, but we just have to have a little bit of blueprint of hardware back at the campus just to meet our uh, SLAs. We do have you know, some networking and some authentication. But um, we, we will be there at the end of the year, and uh, we will reduce that hardware blueprint so we will not have a lot of uh, virtualization back. Um, then eventually we're gonna close that data center. That data center is gonna save us cost and energy. Uh, we do have the, the Grow, Go Green initiative, and what that's gonna do is we're gonna be a better partner on campus and into an environment and to the community as well, so. 
I think that's all I have, gentlemen. Do you want to do Q and A's? Jennifer? Questions for any of our speakers? Yep. First, thanks for your time today and filling in. Yeah, I was, uh, when I was meeting Ezra for the first time, he goes, hey, I got a job for you. <laughs> so. Yeah. So I was just curious, um, how frequently are you taking snaps and how long do you retain your backups? Uh, we're taking snaps nightly. Uh, we'd retain a minimum of uh, 30 days. Our production environment runs 30 days of snapshots within our policies. We do, like I said, we do an East Coast and a West Coast uh, backup. And for our DR, we put one in our DR. Our testing and, and, and development environment, we're not too much worried about it. Uh, we do continuously do 30 days in that environment, but we do not copy it from one region to another because we feel that we can put our production environment over there and they can um, rec recover from there. Just a follow up, do you have a long term retention requirement? And if so, how would you do that? Uh, yeah, we do have in a, basically in our Oracle environment, our Oracle environment, they want at least uh, 18 months. So they've taken the, they're using our man in combination of a CPM to do backups. And we do take that infra data, that database data, and we're doing that every 15 minutes. Uh, for a short term, we're doing 15 minutes some backups on for the the databases, and uh, we're doing 18 months by copying that information to an S3 bucket. Does that answer your question? Other questions? All right. Thank you to our three speakers. We'll take a short break. The next set of sessions will begin at 2 p.m.